something I have a great passion for is uh, CTA and CT perfusion uh, and stroke. Um, we've been doing it at Baptist Hospital for about 22 years now. So I'm very excited that a lot of people in the country are now doing it as well. So here we go. Uh, some disclosures. Okay, so the objective <clears throat> is to review the components and rationale for the use of multimodal brain CT for acute ischemic stroke. We want to describe the basics of the neurophysiology of brain perfusion, understand the reason for the slow acceptance of CT perfusion. Again, we were doing it 22 years ago, and it only really started catching on probably about the past seven years or so. Define a large vessel occlusion, uh, ischemic penumbra, and also define core infarct. And let's talk about which of these perfusion maps matter. And we're going to review a bunch of cases. So what we do in CT for stroke is called a multimodal brain CT. We do the non-contrast brain, the CTA, the CT perfusion, and the post-contrast brain. And this fulfills the six Ps of imaging for acute stroke. You want to see the parenchymal anatomy, the pathology, because the clinical diagnosis of stroke is wrong approximately 13% 13, 13 of the time. You want to look at the plumbing, which is obviously the vessels. You want to look at the physiology and see what's uh, ischemic and what's possibly dead. And that's where we look at perfusion. We want it to be pretty damn quick, right? Uh, time is brain. And we want it to obviously be safe. Yes, the P is silent. So before we start going on to the CTA and CT perfusion part, I just want to talk a little bit about the uh, Alberta Stroke uh, Program Early CT Score, otherwise known as ASPECTS. <clears throat> many of you probably have heard of it and many of you probably use it, but not every site I speak to does. So I just want to review it briefly for those who are not familiar. So what they want to do is they want to break up the middle cerebral artery uh, distribution into 10 segments. So a normal brain CT, you would have an aspect of 10. And for each segment that you lose in the MCA territory, you lose a point when you see early acute ischemic changes. So the first uh, point is the insula, if you lose that. The caudate is another point. The lentiform nucleus is another point. And the internal capsule is another point. And then we go to the six cortical areas. We have what we term M1, which is anterior to the sylvian fissure, M2, just posterior to the sylvian fissure, and then M3, a little bit more posterior. If we go to the supraganglionic level, we then have what we call M4, M5, and M6. And again, each segment that has early acute ischemic changes, you're going to lose a point. So when we see patients, we want an aspect of the higher the number, the better, uh, because the uh, healthier the brain tissue is. So let's talk about the neurophysiology of perfusion. So neurologic dysfunction occurs in the tissue after the cerebral blood flow falls approximately below 18 to 20 cc's per 100 grams of tissue per minute. Below 10, it can't be tolerated beyond a few minutes before infarction occurs. CBF between 10 and 20 cell death may take minutes, could take hours. And this is where we can uh, intervene. So why use CT perfusion? Well, it can aid in locating the occluded vessel, as we'll see, and this will guide the management for potential thrombectomy. We can detect stroke mimics such as seizure and migraine, and we'll show some examples. We may detect infarcts without a large vessel occlusion, and this will also help the neurologist sleep better at night that he made the correct diagnosis. Detect other sites of unsuspected infarction, such as bilateral, which is something that unfortunately we saw in the peak of the uh, COVID pandemic, many sites of uh, bilateral infarction at the same time. You can estimate your tissue at risk, otherwise known as your ischemic penumbra. And you could also estimate your core infarcts, already infarcted tissue. So if it's so useful, CTP is so useful, why has it taken over 20 years to gain this widespread acceptance? Well, part of it was we didn't have good treatment for LVO. 
Here's some evolution of the stroke studies from 2004 to 2012. There were multiple studies that came out and showed there was no benefit to uh, intraarterial therapy versus uh, IV therapy. And a couple of these studies include synthesis expansion and the IMS3. Now, what's interesting back then, the intraarterial therapy was only IATPA 41 to 66% of the time. And stent retrievers, which then became a mainstay, was used in less than 14% of the time. So not surprisingly, they didn't get very good angiographic results. The TIKI 2B and 3 results were only 41%. So it's not that surprising. They didn't see a significant difference between standard of care or IA therapy uh, by MRS or death at 90 days. But then we have Return of the Jedi here. 2015, a whole bunch of studies actually showed positive um, results for raw thrombectomy. We have the Mr. Clean trial, the escape trials with Prime and Extend IA. What these had in common was this time, they most of them use stent retrievers 59 to 100% of the time. Now look at the recanalization rate they would get. Tiki 2B and 3, 72 to 88%. That's like double what they were getting prior to this. And not surprisingly, you had an improved uh, modified rank and scale at 90 days compared with control. And two of these studies actually used CT perfusion. And you can see the MRS 0 to 2 at 90 days in these studies, 71% versus 40% and so on. So what's the impact of this? Well, in order to have one additional stroke patient be independent at 90 days, the number needed to treat is somewhere between three and seven patients, depending on which of these studies you look at. That's pretty good. That's an amazing therapeutic ratio. If you compare that to the what they use to justify the STEMI treatment approach, they have to treat about 17 patients for that one good outcome. We were just doing between three and seven for that one good outcome. <clears throat> which probably means we weren't treating enough patients. So in 2015, because of all these positive studies, the uh, American Stroke Association updated their guidelines from two years previous. They usually don't do this that often. And if you just kind of look at the, what I call the three sixes, they said, you know, if you had a large vessel occlusion, which they defined as ICA or proximal MCA M1, and your NI stroke scale was six or greater, your aspects was uh, greater than or equal to six, and the treatment could be initiated within six hours of symptom onset, they actually recommended uh, patients go for endovascular therapy. What about beyond six hours? Well, 2017 and 2018, two other groundbreaking trials came, the DAWN and Diffuse 3 trial. They looked at the greater than six hour time frame when the patient was last known well. One study goes up to 24 hours, one goes up to 16 hours. Now, if you look at the DAWN trial, they were looking at kind of small infarct volumes. The largest they would go up to was 51 cc's to be included in the trial. And they also said you couldn't have an infarct greater than one third the MCA territory. Diffuse three, again, the occlusion ICA or M1, but they allowed infarct volume up to 70 cc's. They wanted the ratio, again, this is on CT perfusion of the ischemic tissue to the initial infarct volume as being greater than or equal to 1.8. And they wanted an absolute volume of potentially reversible ischemia at greater than or equal to 15 cc's. I want you to not memorize these numbers because one thing I don't want people to do is be numerologists when it comes to treating stroke, but I wanna show you how things evolve over time and why you shouldn't be numerologists. Aspects uh, at the time should be greater than or equal to six. So what about the results of these two trials? <clears throat> well, just like the other trials, they actually showed an improvement of functional independence at 90 days, 49% for thrombectomy versus 13% for control and dawn and diffuse three was very similar. So now let's talk about how do we define a large vessel occlusion because in the literature, it's not always consistent. So this working group was talking about thrombectomy for distal medium vessel occlusions and they have a consensus statement. And what, how they defined large vessel occlusion was via vessel distance and the tortuosity and the vessel size. So 
without argument, you could say proximal large vessel is the intracranial ICA, M1 MCA, intracranial vertebral arteries and basal artery. That kind of makes sense. Distal medium vessels, M3 and M4 makes sense, A2 to A5, all that makes sense. When it comes to M2, these are the most difficult to categorize. Why? Because they have such a variable variability in their branching patterns. They could branch early, they could branch late, they could have very dominant M2 divisions. It could really uh, be very different. So to show that, here's just a typical CTA of a patient that has a little bit of different side to side. Here's the M1 segment. Now, is that very different than this M2 segment? No, it's about the same in size, not much difference in uh, beyond the, um, the M1 segment, and it hasn't even uh, started curving up yet. So why isn't that an LVO or an LVO equivalent? Same patient, if you look here, this M1 segment is considerably larger than this M2 segment. So you could see why there's variability in what people consider, quote unquote, an LVO. How do we uh, perform CT perfusion? First, you want to inject iodinated contrast 50 cc's through a large gauge intravenous catheter at a high rate. You're going to do repetitive CT images acquired through the same volume of brain tissue as the contrast traverses the cerebrovascular circulation from arterial to parenchymal to venous phases. Now, I get some sites saying, well, we don't want to do CT perfusion because it takes too long. Well, it takes about 65 seconds for the acquisition. That's a little over a minute. I'm sure uh, you have the time for that for the patient. And there's only 19 seconds of total exposure time. Processing of the data, which is really nice now that we have uh, software such as Viz that actually post-processes the data automatically and gives you these color maps that uh, come back to your raw uh, app and to your raw uh, pack system. Years ago, we had text, you know, doing it or we were manually doing it. So it's actually a great time to be doing CT perfusion. On its simplest level, this is a graph of what CT perfusion looks like. You inject contrast, it goes up, there's a time to the maximum peak, and then it washes out here. If you take that area under the curve, that's approximately equal to your cerebral blood volume. If you take this curve at half its width, that's the mean transit time. If you divide the cerebral blood volume, be by the mean transit time, that's approximately equal to your cerebral blood flow. So let's talk about these terms. What do we mean by cerebral blood flow? Well, that's the volume of blood per volume of brain per unit of time. Cerebral blood volume is your volume of brain per, I mean, your volume of blood per volume of brain. This is not only influenced by the direct arterial input function, but it's also influenced by collaterals and vasodilatation, the things that are going to keep your brain alive until you get reperfusion therapy. Mean transit time is just your average transit time for contrast balls to pass through volume of brain. And the Tmax is the time until maximum contrast Hounsfield unit density for that region. So what do we consider our core infarct? In general, the CBF less than 30% of normal brain is going to be our core infarct. The Tmax greater than six seconds is going to be our area of ischemic tissue. Mismatch volume is just taking that ischemic tissue minus your core infarct, and that's your ischemic penumbra. Again, Tmax greater than six minus the less than 30% cerebral blood flow. Your mismatch ratio is that your ischemic tissue divided by your core infarct or your Tmax greater than six seconds divided by your CBF less than 30. So if you look at this patient here, on the top, you have the CBF less than 30, which is going to be your surrogate for your core infarct. And here it says 13 cc's. Tmax greater than six seconds is 174. Uh, CC. So this is your ischemic tissue here. The mismatch volume or your ischemic penumbra here is 161 cc's. The mismatch ratio is very high, 13. So this would be a good therapeutic ratio benefit. Which thresholds do we use to call ischemic tissue? Well, if you look at the app, they'll give you four seconds, six seconds, eight seconds, and 10 seconds. 
In general, we use the uh, greater than six seconds for acute ischemic tissue. You can have uh, greater than four seconds and it be within normal range, but it could also be pathologic as, as I will show you. Uh, once it gets above eight seconds and 10 seconds, you know, obviously the uh, tissue is more likely to infarct, but six seconds is really what you want to uh, look at for the most part. Hypoperfusion index is something that's there. Some people use it. Uh, I personally do not. Uh, some people use it for research purposes. What about threshold for the uh, core infarct? I said it's we're using less than 30% of normal brain tissue. That's because it's been validated to be the most accurate in predicting core infarct in about the six hour or less time period. Now, if you wanted greater sensitivity, you could go to the 38%, or if you wanted greater specificity, you could go to the 20% where it's really reduced and, oh yeah, this is definitely dead. But again, 30% is pretty much your sweet spot. However, as we will see, this can overestimate the core infarct in the earlier time period, that is less than three hours. On the app, you'll also see motion detection graphs. You wanna look at these to make sure that the patient wasn't moving too much that would make the uh, data spurious. Usually you'll know that because you might get a warning or the maps just won't look right. Thankfully, they do have uh, AI that corrects for motion. So it's very rare that I have to say that the uh, perfusion is non-diagnostic due to motion. But what you wanna see are basically three straight lines, this patient is obviously moving a lot in the X, Y, and Z direction. Imperative, imperative to view the qualitative maps, not just those quantitative maps with the numbers that I just showed you. These may help uncover areas of acute ischemia that don't reach that Tmax greater than six seconds, but may still be important for treatment decisions. So if you look here, I don't even care, you know, that I don't have a number. I see there's acute ischemia here in that right MCA territory. So we will show examples again of why it's important to look at those. Again, I'll kind of just reiterate. Our Tmax greater than six seconds is your most sensitive, but your least specific indication of acute infarction. Your CBF of less than 30% is your most specific, but your least sensitive. And in our quantitative era, you subtract those two, and that's your ischemic penumbra. If you're doing MRI, restricted diffusion is obviously your ischemic core. Now, when we're doing uh, CT perfusion, we're using CBF as less than 30%. It is not as accurate as DWI. DWI is still the gold standard. Tmax greater than six, again, your ischemic penumbra. <clears throat> when looking through um, your images, Sometimes if you see something that doesn't make sense, look at your arterial input function and venous outflow function time curves. The app will actually put the arterial input function on it for you. You don't have to do this. I don't put it on a venous outflow. The arterial input function and the app usually will find it using the algorithm. It'll be on a major artery, ideal to be on the side contralateral to the event. There are rare times, um, very few times that it doesn't pick the right artery and there are certain ways you can actually choose a different arterial input function. Um, but in general, you're going to have uh, a correct AIF. Then you need to look at the activity uh, curves here because what you wanna see are two peaks. This is your arterial peak and this is your venous peak. The venous peak is always later and it's always uh, denser than the uh, arterial peak. And the difference between these two peaks is usually about seven seconds or less. If it's expanded and it's longer, there may be a uh, problem between the arterial and venous phases as we will see. So let's go to some case studies. Case one, 57 year old male, left-sided weakness and slurred speech. You can see there's a subtle hyperdense clot in the right middle cerebral artery. If you look closely here, there's probably some early acute ischemic changes in the right frontal operculum, so you'd probably knock out one for your aspect score. 
Here's the CTA. Now we don't get the 3D CTAs right away, but I'm doing this for illustrative purposes. And you could see the right MCA occlusion over here. The CT perfusion comes up and we see the area of predicted core infarct is about 47 cc's. Again, CBF less than 30% denoted in red. Tmax greater than six seconds, which is your acute ischemic tissue is about 92 cc's. Our mismatch volume is then 45 cc's and our mismatch ratio is two. This is a good therapeutic ratio to go ahead and do thrombectomy. So they were taken to the angio lab by my partners at the time. And you could see the right MCA occlusion on the uh, AP and lateral. And they got an excellent uh, thrombectomy result, a ticky 2 b result. But I always say, how did the patient do? Well, this patient did very well. The area of infarction was really limited to that right frontal operculum, which was very well predicted by the CT perfusion and it spared all those other areas uh, up higher. So this was a uh, good outcome. Now, how about this patient? Patient in their 60s, acute right-sided facial droop and right-side hemiplegia. Now this one, I actually got direct image capture from the app. So if it looks familiar to you, it's because it was directly off the app. You could see this subtle hyperdense clot in the left middle cerebral artery that if you click the aspects button, you'll see it a little bit nicer here. And then we go up, up higher at the basal ganglionic level and hit the aspects button. You could see there's excellent gray white differentiation here. The um, deep nuclear well seen. So we gave this an aspects of 10. And then we got the alert. Now they've updated the app where you'll get an alert and it'll be a yellow icon and it'll actually sell it, say LVO. Uh, back when we did this one, we would get a yellow border, which would be the LVO alert. And it goes right to the level of suspected occlusion, which is right here in the left middle cerebral artery. Now, if we look at the CT perfusion maps, it's saying that right now there's no core infarct, zero CCs but there's a lot of acute ischemic tissue, 131 cc's, excellent uh, amount of volume to go after, 131. The mismatch ratio can't be calculated because a number over zero is not a real number. Um, and again, I always want people to look at these color maps and to get used to them. Basically the Tmax is very important here. You could see the elevation, the left MCA. Here it is. Again, this is directly off the app, coronal and axial uh, reformatted images. You can see the left M1 occlusion. And here it is the CTA of the neck component. You could see there was an ICA occlusion. So this was a tandem occlusion from the ICA and MCA. And they went on to angiography. You could see the ICA occlusion which they were able to open up with a very ugly looking irregular stenosis here, which they then um, got up and saw the M1 occlusion. They stented the stenosis and they were able to get a thrombectomy and get an excellent angiographic result. This patient did very well. Now you see they have a left basal ganglionic infarct kind of the left posterior corpus striatum, a couple of little tiny areas in the white matter, minimally in the gray matter, but most of the left MCA was spared. One thing I will say is when something involves the M1 segment of the middle cerebral artery, you are almost always going to have a basal ganglionic infarct because those are coming from perforating lenticular stride vessels that have zero collaterals. And therefore, once they're occluded, they're going to go on to infarct rather quickly. I've only seen a few cases with M1 occlusions that didn't get a basal ganglionic infarct. Case three, elderly patient with altered level of consciousness. Now, if you look in the center image here, you could see there's hyperdense clot within the basilar artery. Right now, the parenchyma looks good, so no definite uh, acute infarct or hemorrhage seen. We did a CT angiogram, and this patient has very poor-looking vessels, a lot of atherosclerotic disease. You can see the clot filling that entire basilar artery here. The PCAs look like they're open, but obviously the basilar is out. And one of the reasons I show this case is because I've uh, been on panels with other speakers that say, well, you know, you can't do CT perfusion in the posterior fossa. And I say, who says I can? I mean, 
It may be a little bit harder because of the Petrus pyramids, a little bit more artifact, but we get frequently get diagnostic studies in the posterior fossa, just like in this case. And you could see the acute ischemia involving the brainstem and the bilateral cerebellar hemispheres and no core infarct at this time, 78 cc's, mismatch volume 78, and the mismatch ratio, again, not applicable. This patient goes on for angiography. You see the basilar occlusion, which they're able to open up very uh, nicely. And you can see all the um, vessels uh, perfusing nicely. And how did the patient do? The patient actually did very well. Remember, basilar artery occlusion is usually, you know, a death sentence or at least a very bad disability sentence. They did have a little perforating infarct in the uh, right side of the pond here, but otherwise did very well. In contradistinction to this patient, case number four, elderly patient found aphasic, right-sided hemiparetic. Now, Looks a little similar to the other one. You have a couple of lacunar infarcts, atrophy, chronic small vessel disease in the periventricular white matter. But if you look back here, there's some early gray-white differentiation loss along the left temporal parietal and even occipital lobe. Here's the CT angiogram, and we see there's a left middle cerebral artery occlusion. But we also see there's a left PCA occlusion. Now, this doesn't happen often but it can happen. Actually, it happens rarely. Here's the CT perfusion. Now, this is very different than what I've been showing up till now. Before, I was showing great therapeutic ratios. Now, not so much, right? The CBF less than 30% is 137 cc's. That's a large, very large core infarct. Tmax greater than six seconds, 187 cc's. The mismatch volumes, 50 cc's. This match ratio is 1.4. Not a great therapeutic ratio, but this is one of these things that, you know, the family wanted everything done and, you know, they obliged and they went in and here's the MCA occlusion. Here's the PCA occlusion. It really, you know, basically this whole part of the brain is all bald. And then, you know, they got a decent angiographic result, not a great one. You can see there's still a lot of vessels missing uh, in here, but, you know, they did get that PCO open in some branches of the MCA. But again, how did the patient do? Patient did horribly, right? You could see the patient, just like the core infarct predicted, this big left MCA and big left PCA infarct, which hemorrhagic conversion over here, mass effect left to right midline shift. So this this was not a good candidate. It showed this large core infarct. And you may say, well, you know, why bother treating these? So we will talk about that in the second half of the lecture. So uh, CT, conclusion for part one, CT and CT perfusion are very powerful tools in evaluating patients presenting with acute ischemic stroke. CT perfusion can aid in the accuracy and speed in detecting these LVOs or distal medium vessel occlusions. CT perfusion can help estimate the ischemic penumbra corresponding to a vessel occlusion. And as I've said multiple times, the Tmax is greater than six is our surrogate for volume of acute ischemic tissue. The CBF less than 30 is our core infarct volume and you subtract those and that's your ischemic penumbra. So before Everybody thinks, you know, okay, this is very straightforward. I got it. Now we're going to go to the challenging cases because I want people to realize nothing, you know, just comes up as you want it. And after doing this for 22 years, I'm still learning. So the objectives on this part, we're going to describe the phenomenon of ghost in far core and its potential on patient management. We're also going to describe the phenomenon of what we call perfusion scotoma and its potential on patient management. We're going to reiterate the importance of those qualitative maps, and we'll also re review the hyperperfusion pattern. So here's a middle-aged male. He came to us with acute onset of left hemiparesis, aphasia, high anionic stroke scale of 22, arrived within 30 minutes of onset. Now, that's an important piece of the history, 30 minutes of onset, he was in the hospital. Here's the CT and brain and CTA. Now, unfortunately, the patient has a cochlear implant and you have this tremendous streak artifact. And so, you know, you don't really get the best look at the brain, but here's the CTA and you could see there's no right MCA vessels here. And here's the coronal reformatted image. Now, there are sites that do uh, 
uh, collateral scores on CTAs, this would get the worst number because you don't see any vessels whatsoever. Now let's look at the CT perfusion. This also looks pretty bad, right? CBF less than 30%, 134 cc's of core infarct. Tmax greater than six seconds, 164 cc's. Mismatch volume is only 30 cc's. Mismatch ratio is 1.2. Now I want you to remember in the diffuse three trial, remember we spoke about that, they excluded patients with core infarct of greater than 70. This is nearly double that. They also excluded patients with mismatch ratio of less than 1.8. This is 1.2. But this patient came in within 30 minutes of onset. Diffuse three looked at the six to uh, 24 hour onset, right? So this is very different. But what if this was a wake up stroke and the last time seen normal was last night? How would you treat this patient? Would you exclude them from thrombectomy? Well, we did not. Again, we at least knew the time period, but you may not know the time period. So you could see the right MCA occlusion, which they got an excellent angiographic result. And I always say this, that's not the end of the story. How did the patient do? Patient did very well. Here was their 24 hour follow-up again. The street guard effect makes it difficult. He couldn't get an MRI. There's probably some areas of infarct here, but his NI stroke scale was three. So the patient did very well, went from a 22 to a three. So a couple of papers came out with uh, this concept of ghost infarct core. The four, first uh, article was, I believe, in 2017, and this was a follow-up article in 2018. And it looked at what they said was, Patients with large vessel occlusion and aspects of greater than or equal to six. And at the time they were using the rapid perfusion software, but it happens with all of them. Um, and they use the surrogate as um, for the core as CBF less than 30%. Ghost in FAR core was then defined as greater than 10 cc's difference between the core predicted versus the final infarct. The median onset of symptoms to CT perfusion was about three hours. Ghost infarct core was seen in 16% of the patients. The earlier time window was an independent predictor for this ghost infarct core. So let's look at this. This is from the article. This is not my case, but it looks almost identical to my case. Patient last seen well, 1530, wakes up at 1600. Hospital arrival, 1700, okay? And here's their brain CT, aspects of 10. Here's their core infarct. 143 cc's, that's terrible. Big, you know, acute ischemic area, but large core infarct. They go to angiography, they get to the angiolab very quickly. They see the right MCA occlusion, they open it up nicely. And here's the CT on day three. Where is that large core infarct that they predicted here? We don't see it. That's ghost infarct core, meaning it may not be dead yet. So the teaching point here is in the presence of a large vessel occlusion, the brain gets the benefit of the doubt whether there's salvageable tissue. That is, don't let a large perfusion core talk you out of reperfusion therapy in a patient that is otherwise a candidate, as long as that aspect score is reasonable. And up until now, we've been saying greater than or equal to six and saying it's a moving target. And this is especially true in that earlier time period. But you may not know when the patient was last seen well. So wake up strokes can fall into this category as well. So breaking news, about two to three studies have now shown that if you do thrombectomy for large ischemic strokes, large cores or bad aspects, they may do better as well. This is one of the uh, studies that came out of the New England Journal of Medicine February of this year. And this was called the SELECT-2 trial. And they, they took patients with ICA or M1 occlusions within 24 hours of onset. And they included aspect scores, really poor ones, three to five or core and far greater than 50 cc's. Their functional independence was 20% in the thrombectomy arm versus 7% in the medical care arm. So, and the mortality was similar. So now we're starting to rethink our whole thing of, you know, futile thrombectomy. It doesn't mean we treat everybody with an aspect of three or to five or a large core, but now we actually give it more thought depending on the circumstances for each patient. So now let's talk about the flip side. 
This case on arrival, this was one of these cases that just sits in your list, could be there 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. It's just one of the stats sitting in your uh, list. It wasn't a stroke protocol, but my partner who was reading at the time uh, got the history as altered mental stack, drug ingestion, less known well, uh, greater than eight hours. And she was very astute to pick up this right MCA plot. And she also noted that there were early acute ischemic changes along the right frontal and temporal parietal operculum here, and maybe even in the basal ganglia. She called the ER physician and said, this person's having a stroke. This was at one of our spoke hospitals. And we said, we need to bring it to the comprehensive stroke center. And he said, no, no, this is a drug ingestion. This is not a stroke. She said, no, I'm telling you it's a stroke, send the patient. So they had to, you know, stabilize the patient, you know, get the ambulance, send the patient up. Upon transfer, patients moving all over. We did another brain CT before we went ahead and did the CT and CT perfusion because it had been a while. But you could again see the areas of low attenuation, even through the uh, movement artifact here in the right MCA territory. They gave it, I believe, in aspects of about six. Patient finally gets their CTA and you could see the right M1 occlusion here. Now let's look at the CT perfusion. I just said it was an aspects of about six and I already saw the acute ischemic changes on CT and we're saying core infarct is only two CCs. Were we imagining it? Really? Where is it? Okay, well, the acute ischemic area is very large here in the right cerebral hemisphere, so mismatch volume is huge, but we're saying there's no core infarct, but what's going on here? So now we look at the color maps, which really didn't uh, help us further in this case. So the patient goes on to angiography. You could see the right MCA occlusion. Now there may be some trickle flow antegrade and some retrograde flow here, but obviously very poor uh, visualization of right MCA branches. They do the thrombectomy and get an excellent angiographic result. Is this the end of the story? No. How did the patient do? Well, not great. Um, you know, those areas that we saw in brain CT were absolutely truthful. It was just not seen on the CT perfusion. You could see it on the uh, diffusion weighted MRI in the right MCA territory and on the uh, right side here, you could see petechial hemorrhage in the basal ganglia as well. So why didn't we see this on CT perfusion? Well, the UCSF group came out in uh, 2020 with this article saying, recent administration of iodinated contrast renders core infarct estimation inaccurate using rapid software. And they based it on, again, their spoken hub model. And when they would do a CTA, uh, at let's say a spoke hospital, and then they would get transferred, and then they would do the CT perfusion. They felt that the iodinated contrast was that they received previously was making the CT perfusion inaccurate. And here's their case. This isn't my case, this is their case, but again, it looks identical to my case, right? You could see the right MCA, you have the abnormal aspect score here in the operculum, right? The insula, they have a right MCA occlusion, and here's their CT perfusion. On the left side of the screen is their core infarct. They have zero, look at this. This was a zero core infarct, really, and their acute ischemic tissue was 86 uh, CCs. And obviously, here's the MRI showing the right MCA uh, infarct. So is this related to, you know, patient having contrast on board? Well, then this article came out a couple of months later in Stroke Journal, where they correlated the aspect score um, in patients with large vessel occlusion in the delayed time window, six to 24 hour time period, also using rapid software. But again, it happens with all the different softwares. Now, if you uh, look at this scatter plot, I just want to draw your attention to this. Your non-contrast aspect score, the higher it is, the lower your core infarct volume should be. The lower your aspect score, right? The higher core infarct it should be. And, you know, their approximate line is how it should be. But look how much variation there is. Look at this patient over here. They have an aspects of three and they only have a core infarct of about five, really? You know, so it's not related to just contrast. So um, myself and my partner, Dr. DeBoos, um, published this article in AGNR last year uh, called Perfusion Scotoma, a potential core underestimation CT perfusion in these delayed time windows when we're seeing this abnormal aspect score. 
So the postulated mechanism for perfusion scotoma is this early reperfusion and luxury reperfusion. It's usually later on and the patient's already starting to reperfuse it either through the main vessel, other vessels, luxury perfusion. Contrast staining, we can't say that's not an element of it. It's certainly a possibility. Smoothing algorithms could be possible and something that we don't even realize right now. So why is recognizing the perfusion scotoma important? Well, if it's not recognized, you know, you're going to call your interventionalist and say, oh, there's a huge uh, mismatch here. And they're going to be like, are you kidding me? The person has an aspect of three. So you want to be on the same page and you don't want to subject the patient to futile thrombectomy and also potentially worsening patient outcome and perfusing a very large volume of infarcted tissue. As we know, uh, our neurointerventionalists are not uh, very... Uh, abundant these days, and we want to utilize their resources and personnel where it can make a positive difference rather than potentially diverting these valuable resources. And then they could also discuss realistic expectations with family members when getting consent and telling them, well, there's already a large infarct here. Case number three, 78-year-old uh, patient with expressive aphasia, right side facial droop, started the day before, then resolved, then recurred. Um, and I had stroke scale of three. So this is basically crescendo TIAs. Aspect score is uh, 10, so it looks good. You look at the CTA, you know, nothing to see here, right? Initially, huh? you know, next case, right? Look at the CT perfusion, zero core, 0.5 cc's greater than six seconds. That can get anybody out of bed, really? Is it even real? Is it an artifact, a little green dot there? Then we get the... Um, LVO alert here, and it goes to the vessel that suspected occluded. Okay, now let's go look at these CT perfusion maps a little bit more closely. Remember those qualitative maps I said are so important to look at. If you look here, the Tmax greater than four seconds is in a vascular distribution of the left temporal parietal lobe. And if you look at the color maps here, the left temporal parietal lobe is acutely ischemic. It doesn't rise to the greater than six seconds, most of it, but it's ischemic and the patient's symptomatic. So now we go back and we can find that nearly occlusive clot in the posterior division of the proximal M2 segment left middle cerebral artery. Now, if you rotate that CTA around that I first showed you, now you could see that um, occlusive or near occlusive clot in that posterior division. They went on to angiography, and again, it was a near total occlusion, a very thin rim of contrast, getting through very poorly perfused distally, but they were able to get a ticky three result after just one pass of the aspiration catheter. And this patient did very well. Their aphasia and facial droop resolved, and this was their 24-hour follow-up. So if you're just doing CTA, how good are we at picking up large vessel occlusions? This article in the AJNR in 2020 looked at it and said, well, if it's an ICA or an M1 occlusion, we're not likely to miss it. Number of missed LVOs at initial CTA evaluation, zero, okay? If it's an M1 segment occlusion, that compromised 37% of occlusions, but also accounted to almost 18% of missed LVOs at initial CTA evaluation. M2 occlusions account for... 48%. Again, they're calling it large vessel occlusion. Some people call it distal medium vessel occlusion, but they accounted for 82% of missed LVOs or those M2 segment occlusions. Again, this is CTA only without CT perfusion. You're likely to miss that M2 occlusion versus an M1 or an ICA about six, six to one odds ratio. So can CT perfusion help miss these um, Distal. Now, this article calls them, they don't call it large vessel occlusion, they don't call it distal medium vessel occlusion, this one called it distal vessel occlusions. But can the CT perfusion help in picking these up? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, when you're using these Tmax maps, the sensitivity for these vessel occlusions on CTA increased from about 71% to 90%. The specificity increased from 88% to about 96%. For those M2 occlusions, sensitivity also increased from about 61 to 
The other nice thing about it is the median interpretation times were over three times faster for the attendings. And I got to tell you, I don't give the CTA results initially. If I don't see an LVO, I wait for that CT perfusion result because I don't want to call them back and say, oh, first I said there was a large vessel occlusion, but I saw the perfusion. Now I could go back and find it. So it definitely helps you read the CTA faster and also makes you feel more confident that you have the right uh, abnormality. Next case is an 87-year-old female with history of AFib on anticoagulants presented to our ED, last seen normal approximately six hours prior, acute onset of severe right hemiparesis, left-sided gaze deviation, and aphasia, and I stroke scale 17 at arrival. Here's the non-contrast brain CT, and you can see there's a hyperdense clot in the supraclinoid left internal carotid artery. The aspect score was 10. We did a CTA, and again, we got the LVO alert with the yellow border here, and it goes right to the level of that supraclinoid left ICA occlusion. Now let's look at the CT perfusion. No core infarct, that's great. Where's all the acute ischemic tissue? It's only four cc's, really? I just said we had a left ICA occlusion. Now, if this person was part of the diffuse three trial, the absolute volume of potentially reversible ischemic tissue needed to be greater than or equal to 15 cc's to be eligible for treatment. This only had four cc's, but again, they weren't part of the trial, thankfully. So what do we do? We look at these color maps, see what's going on. Remember, they have an anti stroke skeleton. It's uh, 17. Now, if we look at the Tmax here, you could see this elevated red here, this acute ischemic area that involves the internal capsule and the optic radiation. And that's supplied, the anterior, supplied by the anterior choroidal artery. So that's what's really acutely ischemic. Plus, there is some ischemia in the PCA territory, although not severe. So let's go back to the CTA here. You can see there's a left ICA occlusion in the neck and supraclinoid. But you can see there's excellent crossfill here across the A1, ACOM, A1 junctions, right? Now, when we go back, we can look at the delayed images and you can see that there's a clot in a left posterior communicating artery that's a near fetal origin of that left posterior cerebral artery. So the only thing that's keeping that PCA alive right now is this little one wimpy P1 segment here, but thankfully it's doing a job in keeping the left PCA alive with just mild ischemia. So they go on to angiography. You could see the left ICA occlusion. They're able to get a uh, microcatheter through there, go up, take all the uh, clot out and get an excellent angiographic result, okay? Not only is the ICA open, but now that near fetal origin, the left PCA, PCA is open, right? And if you go and zoom this up, the anterior cordial artery is, is now open. But is that the end of the story? And this is the amount of clot that came out of this patient, large volume of clot. But is that the end of the story? No. How did the patient do? The patient did excellent. NIH stroke scale of zero at 24 hour follow up and a totally normal uh, brain CT. Phase five acute aphasia and confusion, aspects 10, nothing to see here. CT perfusion, zero, zero, nothing to see here. However, go to those color maps. The color maps, now everything I've been showing you until now has showed elevated Tmax. Now I'm showing you decreased dark blue Tmax here in the left MCA and left PCA territories, left temporal, parietal, and occipital. And if you look on the CBF and CBV maps, it's actually elevated cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood volume. So this is actually hyperperfusion. And then this is hyperperfusion from seizure. And you will see this not uncommonly with patients with seizure. The other thing that's very useful for you to look at is the CTA. You can also you know, make sure that not only the vessels are open, but frequently they will be vasodilated on that side compared to the opposite side. The last thing you could do is your version of a physical exam and look at the patient's eyes. 
Now, again, if it's a uh, left MCA infarct related to the, uh, the symptoms, the eyes are going to deviate towards the side of the abnormality. Usually with seizure, the eyes deviate away from the uh, side of the brain abnormality, such as in this patient. So the hyperperfusion pattern, you can see it with seizure. You can see it with early reperfusion, and that's probably why we get some of that CT uh, perfusion scotoma, migraine headache, and uh, post carotid endarterectomy syndrome. It's late in the evening, but I think we have a few uh, more minutes and I call this the bonus round. Uh, if we have enough time and since we do, I'm gonna go into it. This patient came in with altered mental status. He's in the hospital for a while. Uh, MRSA and our carditis, the brain CT, nothing really acute going on here. We do the CT perfusion and it gives us error message, review source data quality and bolus time. And you're like, well, thank God, because this is a whole, you know, you know, a Rorschach test here, what's going on? And there's a lot of green here. There's no uh, core infarct, but what is all this? Oh, maybe it's all posterior fossa. Is this all vertebral basal or occlusion? Because look, the, the cerebellum's gone. The brain stem is ischemic as well. But then when you start going up higher, well, now I'm starting to get some right MCA territory out laterally in the temporal lobe, but also on the other side too, left temporal lobe, you know, and over here, left temporal parietal region. So it's MCA and vertebral basilar. I don't know. So it says check bolus timing. So we go, we look at the bolus timing. It was okay, but the patient moved a lot. And we're like, ah, that's, that's the reason, you know, probably a lot of motion. So we look at these color maps again, but all of the color actually makes sense. It's actually where you would expect it to be. It follows the contour of the brain in the areas of the brain that you would expect to find these abnormalities, right? The Tmax uh, is really elevated here. So what's going on? So let's look at the CTA images. Arteries look great. The vertebral basilar system is fine. MCAs are fine. You know, so that's not going on. What about the venous structures? Well, I don't really see the straight sides, the superior sagittal sinus. I don't know, maybe, you know, that's, maybe we just got a great bolus, you know, great timing. We didn't get venous contamination. Now we look at those arterial input and venous outflow peaks. Remember I said in the beginning, it should be about seven seconds or less between the two. This is about 15 seconds. So a very delayed time of, from the arterial phase to the venous phase. Now we go and look at those delayed images, which you should always look at. Now the venous system is filling. It's not occluded. It's actually engorged. Superior sagittal sinus is like a rope. So is the uh, straight sinus. Why is that? Well, because there's occlusive clot in both trans, uh, in both uh, sigmoid sinuses over here. So there's venous backflow into the uh, and, and, uh, venous hypertensive changes, which is causing the acute uh, ischemia that we see in the venous distribution. Again, the left transverse sinus, not occluded, engorged. But again, more distally, we have a sigmoid sinus occlusion on the right, a sigmoid sinus occlusion on the left. And here is the patient on follow-up. You could see a little petechial uh, hemorrhage from the venous hypertensive changes in the cerebellar hemispheres. So I'm going to uh, conclude here by saying CTA and CT perfusion uh, remain powerful tools in evaluating the patients presenting with acute ischemic stroke, but don't be a strict numerologist. I know if you're doing a clinical trial, you have to be, uh, but uh, in practice, I think you have to have leeway for different uh, things that we discussed today. CT perfusion should not be read uh, without... Um, Assessing the uh, aspect score, the color maps need to be viewed as well, not just those quantitative maps. The core infarct can be overestimated in the early presentation. The earlier, the more likely uh, you may get some ghost infarct core. So beware the ghost infarct core. And the core infarct can be underestimated in that later time presentation, greater than six hours, especially when the aspects is abnormal. So you want to avoid the perfusion scotoma pitfall. 